Thank you very much for uh, uh, coming this evening. My name is Samir Kalani, as Deb uh, mentioned. I'm an endocrinologist, and uh, an endocrinologist is someone who specializes in the field that deals with the endocrine glands in the body that secretes hormones. So most of what I do actually deals with diabetes, thyroid problems, and um, because the bones are controlled by a variety of hormones in the body, it by default probably the, uh, the condition of osteoporosis has been adopted by endocrinologists. So we are supposedly the experts that uh, deal with this condition. Uh, I, uh, I just moved to uh, 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 this part of Massachusetts about uh, eight months ago, in, um, uh, and I came here via Connecticut. I was in Connecticut for three years prior to that. And prior to that, I was in Louisiana. I've been in practice now for close to 20 years. I did my training at the uh, 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 in Cleveland, Ohio at uh, Case Western Reserve, not the Cleveland Clinic. And that was uh, many years ago. I can't even remember how long ago it has been. But it is my pleasure to be here. And tonight, we're going to be talking about osteoporosis. Now, um, osteoporosis is a, a disease of the bone, and it literally means porous bones, osteoporosis. So if you, if you look at a bone under the microscope, the bone looks exactly like a honeycomb with big holes in the middle and the bony, the hard bony structures in between. Just think of a honeycomb. When you develop osteoporosis, what happens is that the, the gaps, those holes in the middle of your bones get bigger and bigger, and those supporting structures, the hard part of the bone is getting thinner and thinner. And that would lead eventually to weakening of the bone. The bone will lose structure and lose strength and will make the bone very susceptible to, uh, uh, to be broken, fractures. Um, and the fractures can be either uh, secondary to a fall, uh, but sometimes uh, uh, people who have osteoporosis can break bones with just minimal uh, normal physiologic activity like sneezing or coughing or even brushing against the furniture. It all depends on the degree of the osteoporosis. The reason why we develop osteoporosis is, is, is a function of either we lose too much bones, or we don't form enough bones, or both. Sometimes you can, you can have both, whereby your body starts losing bone, and at the same time, you're not forming enough bone to replace that, um, and the net result will be uh, a net of, of uh, bone loss. Now, the reason why we are concerned about osteoporosis is many faults. Number one, it is a very common uh, condition. The latest estimate uh, uh, say that there are about 10 million people, 10 million people in this country who have osteoporosis, and there are about 34 million people who are at risk to develop osteoporosis. So that's a good chunk of our population, either already having osteoporosis or at a significant risk for osteoporosis. And, and just to kind of uh, 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 make it uh, more uh, stark, uh, the estimates say that one out of uh, two women above the age of 50 will suffer a broken bone in their life as a result of osteoporosis. One out of every two women in this country above the age of 50 will suffer a fracture of the bone because of osteoporosis. Now, some of these fractures can be serious, some might not be very serious. Now for men, uh, the story is a little bit better, it's one out of four. So it is a very common condition. Second of all, it is a serious condition because just think about it, when you break a bone, um, the pain can be debilitating. Um, um, uh, uh, people who have osteoporosis uh, uh, can sometimes develop some problems with their posture, they lose height. Uh, uh, they stoop, they, they, uh, they, their spine gets hunched. That can affect their balance. That will put them at risk to uh, fall and develop uh, more fracture. Um, and 
if the bone that is fractured happens to be, say, the hip, which is the one that we worry the most about, it is important to remember that about 20% of seniors who break their hip uh, will die within a year, either because of the hip fracture or the surgery or complications of surgery. 20%. So it's important to really prevent those fractures in the first place. Now, even those who are lucky enough to survive past the first year, a lot of them will end up needing long-term care in a nursing home facility. So it, it, it can be a serious medical condition. Thirdly, the third reason why we, we are concerned about it is that it's very costly. It's responsible for about 2 million fractures a year. And the cost of that is estimated to be $19 billion, not million, billion. And, and it, is, it is projected to actually, in terms of the actual number of fractures and the actual cost, it is projected to actually go up exponentially over the next 10, 20 years. And finally, the other reason why we are concerned about it is that it can sneak up on you. A lot of people have osteoporosis or at risk to develop osteoporosis and they don't know about it because uh, when your bones are getting weaker, they don't alarm you, they don't cause any symptoms. We call it a silent disease, a silent condition. Um, as I said, it can sneak up on you and, and it can have in, uh, and, and at the first uh, warning of it could be an actual fracture. So let's talk about some bone basics here. When we think of bones, we, we sometimes tend to think that it's, uh, it's a dead heart tissue, but it's not. Um, uh, we need to realize that a bone is a, is a living structure, is a living tissue, and there is uh, always a continuous process of remodeling inside your bone. Not only when you are a kid or a teenager or a young adult, this process goes on forever. There is constant remodeling, uh, which involves two processes. Old bones is broken down, and new bones, the new bone is formed. And these two processes are coupled. So there are specialized cells in the bone that actually break up old bones, and behind them come another set of specialized cells that will lay down some new formed bones. And as a developing uh, uh, child, teenager, and what have you, the process is, is imbalanced in, in favor of more bone formation. So as we grow in, we get the net more bone formation than bone breakdown, and that's how we build our bones as we are growing up. And at some point, uh, you reach your peak bone mass, that's probably between ages of 18 to 25. And after that, the process actually reverses, whereby you start having a gradual bone loss as you go forward. So from that point on, you get more bone breakdown than bone formation. You're going to continue to have bone formation, but the net is in such a way that you get more breakdown and you start having a gradual net loss of your bone density. And then uh, there are certain medical conditions that will accelerate this bone loss, most notably in women at the, at the time of menopause when there is a sudden precipitous uh, drop in the bone density or the bone, uh, uh, in the bone mass. Now, uh, the question is, uh, for every patient, am I at risk to develop uh, uh, osteoporosis? And, and there are some known factors that um, put you automatically at risk. Some are controllable and some are not controllable. So let's talk about the things that you can do absolutely nothing about, the uncontrollable risk factors. Um, age of 50 and higher is by itself as a risk factor and you cannot do anything about that. Being a female patient, again, is an uncontrollable risk factor. Um, menopause, we talked about that. That's a, a, a natural physiologic uh, a process. Uh, family history, if you have a family history of osteoporosis, 
that by itself will impart on you a risk for osteoporosis. You cannot do anything about these factors. And finally, having a low body weight or having of a small, a small frame. Think about it, if your whole body is small frame, well, everything's gonna be small frame, muscles, bones, and what have you. So these are things that you can absolutely do nothing about. But there are some controllable risk factors that probably most of us can have a say or a plan that we can control. Um, and uh, the, the one that is uh, most important is not getting enough calcium and vitamin D into your system. That's why we talk to uh, young girls when they are in their teen uh, years that they need to uh, uh, eat their dairy, they need to take calcium, they need to make sure that their vitamin D is, is high enough. And I cannot speak enough about vitamin D in this part of the country. Unfortunately, I believe that everyone is vitamin D deficient in, in New England. That's my opinion, and I think a lot of experts will agree with me. We don't get enough sun here, um, long winters. Um, even when we get a sunny day in winter, it's so cold, we're covered from head to toe. There is no way that the sun will help us uh, synthesize or produce enough vitamin D um, under our skin to take care of our needs. So that's something that um, is very important, something we can control. Not eating enough fruits and vegetables has been shown to be uh, a risk factor for osteoporosis. So again, we can tell everybody to eat healthy, balanced meals, fruits and vegetables will help. Eating too much protein, too much sodium, too much caffeine is definitely a risk factor. Um, inactive lifestyle is a risk factor. Uh, smoking is a risk factor. Too much alcohol is a risk factor. And a sudden uh, loss of weight is a risk factor to develop osteoporosis. And those are things, as I said, are controllable risk factors that most of us probably can have um, a, a way to mitigate those risk factors. Now, on top of all of these natural physiologic risk factors, we know that there are certain medical conditions that are associated with increased risk of osteoporosis. Um, and uh, it's not gonna be an exhausted list, but I'm gonna mention them kind of real quick, just to give you a feel and an idea that uh, uh, having other medical condition can put you at risk for osteoporosis. Rheumatoid arthritis multiple sclerosis, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, diabetes, um, thyroid problems, um, low testosterone in men, um, various cancers including leukemia, lymphoma, um, patients who have had a stroke, patients who have Parkinson's, um, patients with lung problems, COPD, um, patients with chronic kidney problems, patients with chronic liver conditions, patients uh, who had just an or had an organ transplant. So if you follow me, it seems that a lot of us have risk factors that will put us automatically um, um, at risk to develop osteoporosis. And some of these medical conditions that are associated with osteoporosis um, the association is not entirely clear of why. Uh, uh, let's take stroke for example. We think that stroke patients uh, uh, are more at risk to develop osteoporosis because their mobility is impaired. They don't, they're not as active and we talked how activity is important to prevent osteoporosis. Their diet is not probably very good. Some of them might not be able to uh, uh, chew their food and consume enough nutrition. So their calcium will drop, their vitamin D will drop, and so on. So, but it is important to realize that there are a, a, a multitude of medical problems that will automatically put you at risk for um, uh, osteoporosis. And then on top of that, there are a bunch of medication that patients might be taking for something else that also will put you at risk to develop osteoporosis. Um, the, the prime example is prednisone or steroids, and, and you can be on that for lung problem or, or rheumatoid arthritis or a variety of other conditions. And we know that patients who take uh, 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 steroids, especially those who take steroids 
high dose of steroid and take steroids for a long period of time are uh, a major risk group to develop osteoporosis. Um, but uh, there are some other medications. Some of them are surprising. Some of the diabetes medications have been reported to uh, uh, be associated with osteoporosis, like Actos. And, and, but the, the, just suffice it to know that there are a lot of medication that by themselves, taking those medications for other medical conditions will put you at risk to develop osteoporosis. Now, th this, as I said, osteoporosis is not a condition that afflicts women uh, uh, alone, but it preferentially attacks women. Out of the 10 million Americans who have osteoporosis at this time, about 80% are women and 20% are men. And uh, uh, as I said, some of that might be related. Actually, we believe that most of that is probably caused by the uh, well, two factors. Women usually have uh, a lower, uh, a smaller belt. So and we said how the body belt can give, uh, a small body belt will give you a high risk for osteoporosis. And then when, uh, when menopause uh, happen, women tend to have a sudden drop in the estrogen level uh, that will um, automatically uh, 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 make them lose 20% of their bone mass at that point on over the next five years after menopause. Um, now, men also uh, are at risk for osteoporosis, but men do not have to go through menopause. Uh, there is a condition called andropause in men, whereby the testosterone level starts dropping as we age, but it's not as striking and it's not as sudden as menopause does uh, happen in women. And uh, that seems to be protective for men. But the same risk factors that um, uh, impart the risk of osteoporosis in women also are true in men. Um, the same risk factors. So how we make a diagnosis? Um, well, first of all, um, when you talk to your doctor, your doctor, he or she will evaluate your risk status. The risk factors that we talked about, some controllable and some are not. And, and based on that, they will decide if, um, if you are at a high risk or not. And there will be, they, next they will order, order something called a bone density test, which is an x-ray that usually measures uh, two or three sides of your bones, typically the spine, the hip, and the wrist. And those are uh, three different subtypes of bones uh, that we like to zoom in on to measure how strong your bones are. And uh, so that's part of the reason why we measure these three bones. But the other reason why we measure these three bones is that most patients who have uh, fractures caused by osteoporosis, these are the three sites that they will have a bone broken in, hip, spine, and wrist. So that's the reason why we measure those, uh, um, 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 those sites. And the bone density, as I said, is an x-ray machine. It's an x-ray test that will uh, uh, generate images of your bones in those three locations and will generate some m m uh, mathematical scores that will be reported back to your doctor. And the scores are called the T-scores. And the T-score gives you a probability of, of, of um, the probability that you will sustain a fracture in that bone. And the T-scores might be different from one bone to the next. So your, your report might say that your T-score in spine is X, your T-score in the hip is Y, and your T-score in the wrist is Z. And that's perfectly fine because we're measuring three different types of bones and and you can have a preferential degree where one part of your body, one bone of your body, is more affected by osteoporosis than others. And it's important for us uh, to know which bones are affected. But at, if any of these bone sites show evidence of osteoporosis, then the patient will need to be treated. The National, Organization, National Osteoporosis Foundation recommends that 
every um, uh, woman above the age of 65 and every man over the age of 70 uh, deserve to have a bone density. And anybody who has had a broken bone, not as a child, but and, and not as a severe traumatic uh, uh, broken bone like in a car accident or, uh, or a motorcycle accident, but anybody who has had a broken bone over the age of 50 deserves to have a bone density. And um, women at any age and men at any age who have multiple risk factors for osteoporosis that we talked about. So the bone density, which is an x-ray test to diagnose uh, osteoporosis, is recommended. And that is the only way that can tell us how much bone mass um, you have at the time. And as I said, that will give us a probability of, of, of having a bone uh, uh, broken. The T-scores are reported in, in numbers. And um, it's the usually minus a number. And the minus means that your bone density is slightly lower than average for your age. And the more negative it is, the weaker the bones are. And um, the, it, the, a T-score of minus 2.5 and worse is diagnostic of osteoporosis. Now, let's talk about the medication. Usually there are two major uh, uh, classes of medication. There is something called the anti-resorptive agents. And those are medications that work on slowing down the bone breakdown. Remember, we talked about this remodeling process that goes on inside your bone at all times and how bones are always broken, old bones is always broken down, and new bones are always formed. Now, the anti-resorptive agents will work to slow down or to stop phase one. So by Taking those medications, you'll start slowing down the process of bone breakdown, whereas you hope that bone formation will continue at the same rate, so the net result hopefully will be improvement in your bones. So that's the first class of drugs, and most of the medications that are available for osteoporosis belong to this class of medication. Now the second class of medication is, is something called the anabolic drugs not to be confused with anabolic steroids here. They're called anabolic drugs because this second class actually will work on the second phase, which is these drugs will actually cause an accelerated or an increased uh, bone formation without affecting the breakdown. So again, the net result hopefully will be an improvement in the total bone mass. Um, there's only one drug that belongs to this second class of medication, the anabolic drugs, and that's Forteo, the injectable medication that patients can self-inject under their skin. Um, Forteo, F-O-R-T-E-O. -E You're welcome. So, so as I said, most of the medication that are available now belong to the first uh, 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 class of drugs the anti-resorptive, and, and, and the most famous, the most talked about, and the most prescribed are what we call the bisphosphonate. Those are the Fosamax, the Actinel, the Beneva, and the Reclast. And uh, uh, Fosamax and uh, Actinel are oral agents. Beneva is available as a, as a pill in addition to an infusion that you come to the infusion center and have it dripped into your veins. Reclass is only an infusion. So those medications have been there probably the longest. They are the oldest group of drugs. And they have been shown collectively across the board to show an improvement in bone density and a reduction in uh, fractures anywhere from 40 to 70 percent. In various medications may have various numbers, but anywhere you should expect, excuse me, a reduction in 
fracture rates with those medications anywhere from 40 to 70 percent. The side effects of those medications, are, some of them are minor, bone, joint pains. Um, stomach problem is very notorious, especially with the oral uh, uh, agents. We tell patients, take this medication first thing in the morning, empty stomach, um, just with a glass of water, and uh, don't eat anything for at least an hour after that. Don't take any other medication for at least an hour. Don't lie down for at least an hour. It's very regimented way of, of, of taking those medications. And the research has shown that if you do it that way, you, you end up without much in terms of GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, reflux, stomach pain, and what have you. Uh, but s some people still develop those side effects, unfortunately, even as they take the medication as prescribed. There are some uh, slightly more serious side effects that have been reported with those medications. Uh, one that got the most um, uh, attention is something called the osteonecrosis of the jaw. That's a medical condition that causes some uh, bone loss in the jaw uh, um, uh, bones. And uh, it, it, it it led to a lot of concerns in the public, uh, uh, understandably, and a lot of patients actually ended up uh, stopping the medication, again, understandably. Uh, a careful analysis of the, um, of the literature, though, uh, shows that the vast majority of patients who develop uh, this condition, the osteonecrosis of the jaw, actually were cancer patients who were taking a, a medication that is related to Fosamax, a medication uh, called Zometa. They were getting that in the IV uh, as a cancer treatment, and they were taking that medication in doses that are much, much higher, and they were taking the medication much more frequently than you would take any of those osteoporosis uh, medication. But Zometa is very much related to Fosamax and Actonil and Beneva and Reclast that a lot of patients got concerned, a lot of healthcare providers got concerned, and, and a lot of patients actually were taken off of those medications. So that's the uh, Fosamax and, the, um, and its related uh, um, uh, uh, agents there. Um, the newest medication is something called Prolea. Prolea, P-R-O-L-I-A, is, is, is another medication totally unrelated to Fosamax. It's something that is injectable under the skin in a doctor's office and uh, once every six months. So this is a medication that, again, is brand new. It's been on the market now for about two years or so. Um, it works very differently. It does not affect the stomach. It does, so far, there is no re reported problems with the jaw or any of that. Um, um, and it also, just like the Fosamax and the other medication, it has been reported in literature to show a good uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent reduction in, in, um, in strokes. Now, Forteo is the only medication that, as I said, belongs to a separate class of drugs. And it's a medication that uh, we, the patient takes as an injection, just like insulin. They take it in the comfort of their own homes. And they do it on a daily basis. So the patient will self-inject this medication for a total of two years. And the reason why uh, there is a, 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 a limit on this medication, this is the only medication that actually the FDA, the only osteoporosis medication that the FDA has um, declared a limit of the uh, duration of therapy on is that there is some concern that this me taking this medication for longer duration may give a risk of a very rare bone cancer. Now, the good news is that this has been reported only in rats, not in humans. And that has been reported in rats. Yeah. 
But in, in all fairness, Forteva has been on the market for about 10 years. So it's not a brand new medication like the others. Uh, but there is still a limit, and it's, it, it's important to know that we only reserve that medication for patients with severe osteoporosis because out of everything that is on the market now, Forteo is the one that gives you more bang for your buck. It's the one that actually gives you the most improvement in bone density with treatment. But again, you, we are limited with using the medication only for two years, and then after that, uh, we'll probably have to uh, revert to something else. Now, the way we measure the response to treatment, obviously, we would like to see an improvement in that bone density score, and definitely we would like to see that the patient has not sustained any fractures, because that's, that's, we're really not treating to make the x-rays look better, we're treating to prevent fractures. So, so the way we measure response to treatment, the way that we can tell the patient with a straight face that they seem to be responding to a medication is that if their T-score, if their bone density is stable or better, okay, so and they have sustained no fracture, then we can tell them that they're responding to the medication. Um, now, lately there has been a talk about was something called drug holidays. And let me give you the background about how that happened. We talked about the Fosamax, the, one of the oldest osteoporosis medication on the market, has been on the market probably now for 15 years. And um, recently there has been some reports, actually over the past three years there has been some reports whereby patients have developed what we would call a paradoxical, unusual fracture of their femur, of their thigh bones. Now you would say, okay, I'm taking a medication to improve my bones to prevent fracture, and now I'm taking this medication, and now you t you're telling me that there is a risk of an atypical uh, fracture of that major thigh bone, and we don't understand why, we don't understand how. Most experts believe that it is extremely rare, but it is a real phenomenon now. And now, whereas in the past we would say once on Fosamax or Actonel, you need to be on those medications for ever, for a long time, uh, these days most experts would tell you that if you've been on those medications for anywhere from three to five years, it probably, and the patient is showing a response to treatment as, as we define. No fracture, the bone density is stable or is improving. Then most experts would tell you it is time to give the patient a drug holiday, meaning to stop the medication and monitor the situation. Um, there are some research that shows that the beneficial effect of those medications on the bone can in many patients last many years after you stop the medication. So that is an argument to actually to, to treat those conditions for a shorter duration than we used to in the past. I think I'm gonna stop here to allow time for questions because I'm pretty sure we're gonna have a few. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Yes. Do they have a negative effect? Yes. Remember, I, I, I started talking about uh, that there are a lot of medication that you can be using for other medical condition, and I did not um, mention all of them, um, that can increase the risk of osteoporosis. Now, we don't fully understand why and how it happens, but statin is one of those. Let me give you a, 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 a rundown of some of those seizure medication like Dilantin or Tegretol, um, um, arrhythm, um, Arrhythmidex, which is a, a cancer treatment, cancer chemotherapy, lithium, which is a very common medication used for bipolar, methotrexate that we use for rheumatoid arthritis, Lexapro, Zoloft, medication that are used extensively for depression, 
um, Actos, um, excess thyroid medication. If you have a thyroid condition and you take too much thyroid medication, that can um, uh, lead to that. And you mentioned the statin. Yes. And, 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 and my, my advice here is that um, decisions in life and by extension decision when it comes to your health care, medicine, is always going to boil down to risk-benefit analysis. Um, if there is a reported risk of statin of inducing osteoporosis, uh, I don't think that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the wise response would be to stop the statin because you're going to have to engage in a dialogue with your healthcare provider to see, okay, what is statin bringing to the table? How is statin helping me? What are the benefits of taking a statin versus what are the risks that statin can bring to me? And, and only by having that dialogue and that discussion can you um, uh, reach a decision that's going to make sense to you. And the decision might be different from one patient to the next. Right. And vitamin D, you didn't mention that as one of the Shame on me. Because all the, all the research that all these uh, osteoporosis medication that I talked about, Fosamax, Reclass, Prolea, all that research was done while patients were taking a large dose of vitamin D. Moral of the story is none of those medications are going to work adequately and none of them will give you the response that you deserve unless you couple that with adequate calcium intake and adequate vitamin D intake. 2,000 units a day? There is still not um, uh, enough consensus out there. Again, it, it depends on the patient. It depends on where you live. I mean, if you live in Florida, you're probably not going to need any at all. If you live in New England, <laughs> you're going to need a lot. And a lot of it might be seasonal as well. Um, uh, I'm a firm believer in measuring vitamin D level because that will guide you as to how much. And, and then following that level up later on will lead you to make the decision, continue with this high dose, cut back, and what have you. Yeah, my doctor had me on 1,000 and she pushed me up to 2,000. Probably there's a good reason for that. She probably measured your level and it was still low. Right. Let me just um, say, let me get to you with the microphone. Okay. So we get the question on the video. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. I'll forgive you, Carlos. She's the boss, so you can blame her. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. What is osteopenia in relation to osteoporosis? Okay. Is that in a more advanced stage and what does that do? Okay. Um, it all depends on the scores that we talked about, okay? So when, when they do that x-ray, they report a score to you. Um, and the score starts with a zero going down. Anywhere up to minus 1.0 is considered normal. Any a score between minus 1.0 to minus 2.5, that's osteopenia. That's a gray zone. You have a, a lower than normal bone density, but it's not severe enough for you to be diagnosed as osteoporosis. So think of osteopenia as a progression, a mild case, something that's going to put you at risk for osteoporosis. My doctor called it the beginning. Semantics. Oh, the beginning. <laughs> Hi. Um, does weight have a factor on osteoporosis also? Does weight? Weight. Usually it's a low body weight or a sudden loss in weight that will impart a significant risk for osteoporosis. We, usually people who are um, overweight or over muscular or big frame, they have stronger bones all things being equal. So, hope that answers your question. Hi, for, for a 60-year-old um, a male, at what point would you, what, what level of testosterone would you start to consider uh, some type of adjunct therapy 
from the normal Fosamax in order to treat osteoporosis. Okay. So, so the question relates to the, uh, the uh, in men who have low testosterone, just like women with low estrogen, that is a risk factor for osteoporosis. And in men who have low testosterone, that could be the reason why they have uh, osteoporosis. Now, in those men, I probably would start by treating the low testosterone first, and then if that does not bring the, the bone density up, then at some point I might consider adding an osteoporosis proper medication, not the other way around. Now to come back to your question, at what level, it depends, the, the, the measuring the level of testosterone can be a little tricky because uh, testosterone level uh, has what we call a diurnal variation, so it's usually highest in the morning and it goes down as the day progresses. So you want to make sure that you check it first thing in the morning. If you check a testosterone level at 12 noon or 4 p.m. and it's low, it means absolutely nothing. You're going to have to check it in the morning. And most experts would tell you, even though on the, on the lab slip it says 250 and higher is normal, I think most experts would tell you that 300 is probably the absolute minimum that it needs to be at. And just as, as a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. w should a person who has been diagnosed initially by primary care just stay with a primary care physician, um, or would you recommend going to an endocrinologist for, for follow-up for osteoporosis, okay. for, on for ongoing care? Well, uh, I think primary care physicians uh, do a great job in a variety of medical condition, and uh, uh, from diabetes, hypertension, and including osteoporosis. And I think most of those patients probably will be managed adequately through a primary care physician. Um, primary care physicians have been eager to actually seek medical assistance in hard to treat cases. Um, so most of the time, if your primary care physician is pushing you to go see somebody, it's because they believe that you need to go see somebody. But it's going to boil down to a personal uh, uh, choice. Uh, uh, if uh, any patient uh, is kind of uh, curious to know if there is something else, newer, better, uh, a, a different way of looking at this situation, whether it relates to osteoporosis or otherwise, I think they owe it to themselves to seek that help. Following that discussion of treating low testosterone um, before treating the osteoporosis, is there any argument uh, with postmenopausal women to treat with estrogen or hormone replacement therapy before an osteoporosis drug? That's a very hot topic. Uh, actually, for years and years, I, I lied. I said uh, Fosamax was the first osteoporosis medication. It was not. For years and years, we use estrogen replacement therapy as a way to treat osteoporosis. And, and there is a lot of good data to suggest that once you replace that low estrogen level in a woman with estrogen replacement therapy, the bones improve. The problem is that uh, study after study kept coming back showing that while you are making it better as far as the bones are concerned, you are opening another can of worms there from blood clots, strokes, heart attacks, slight risk of increasing uh, cancer, especially of the breast, and so on. So on the one hand, you, um, you can improve the symptoms of menopause. You'll definitely improve the bones. And there is some, some evidence to suggest a slightly lower risk of uh, uh, colon cancer. But on the other hand, you bring all that excess baggage to the equation that uh, most experts now do not recommend using estrogen replacement therapy for the sole purpose of treating osteoporosis. You're welcome. Hi, so I'm looking for maybe an opinion. Um, I have two very different opinions from two different endocrinologists. 
and I'm kind of at a loss. So one to the far right being every day I need to do a daily injection of Forteo, and I don't meet many of the criteria. Mm -hmm. um, my bone density was showing severe osteoporosis. And another opinion, because I wasn't comfortable with that at 47, I um, received another opinion and going through some more blood work, however, it was stop your calcium, you have plenty, your levels are fine, you do have osteoporosis, and no real direction. So I'm kind of at a complete loss with where to go from here. Okay. Uh, not, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to give you a few thoughts here. I don't think I'll be able to tell you what's going on, not knowing all the details. But if you have significant osteoporosis at this young age, um, I think it is probably very prudent to look for what we call secondary causes of osteoporosis in your case. And so it, um, I don't know if they looked at thyroid conditions, parathyroid condition, especially if they were talking about your calcium being too much calcium in your body. Is it possible that you have a parathyroid condition that by itself can lead to osteoporosis? And then treating that parathyroid condition then will help with the osteoporosis, maybe even treat it completely um, to the point where you might not even need to be on any medications after that. Um, not knowing all the details, it's very hard for me to uh, make a judgment. But again, too young to have significant osteoporosis to the point where they are recommending the big gun for you. Uh, so maybe an effort to try to look for causes, secondary causes for osteoporosis in your case might be in order. Thank you. You're welcome. She's the boss. She has the microphone. I just work here. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you're aware of any natural treatments for osteoporosis. Um, Instead of medic taking these medications that have side effects. I'm not aware of any medications. And, and the problem that we run into is that for a medication to be proven fully to work for a medical condition, not just osteoporosis, it has to go through the scientific process whereby it's tried on a significant number of patients, thousands of patients, and it has to be in, set up in a way where it's what we call controlled case. So you give half the patients the placebo, half the patient that other medication, and uh, the investigator has to be blinded to whoever is getting the placebo and whoever is getting that so that you eliminate any kind of bias. Now. Because of that, it's going to be very hard to get any strong data, any strong science to support the recommendation of homeopathic natural therapy for osteoporosis short of vitamin D supplementation, calcium, and probably for those women who are low on um, estrogen, probably the use of bioidentical hormones that will give you the estrogen uh, replacement without it being a synthetic product. Okay, thanks. In um, talking about the estrogen replacement, do you know, um, can you give us a target level once someone is um, in, in menopause, what level? Um, an estradiol level should be to be bone protective. And also testosterone, do you, what do you think about that level for women, okay. for bones? Well, let's talk about the, uh, the estrogen. Uh, uh, diagnosing a woman with, with menopause it is not purely a matter of estrogen level at the time because you know that uh, even for women who are not in menopause and not 
anywhere near menopause, their estrogen level can fluctuate during the cycle at times where it can be extremely low. So uh, you really can't make the diagnosis of menopause based on um, a, a blood test result. Uh, you base it clinically and, 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 and you do um, a serial estrogen levels and if the estrogen levels seriously are consistently in the low level, below 30 or so, consistently, um, in, with that clinical picture, then you can tell um, the, the, uh, the female patient that it appears that you are in menopause and this is why. You've got the symptoms, you probably got the, you are in that age bracket and I repeated your estrogen level several times and it's consistently low, so it can't be just a variation of your cycle. Now, the issue of testosterone levels in women Okay, now that's another hot topic there that um, there's a lot of research going on at this time. A lot of experts believe that there is a real phenomenon whereby um, uh, testosterone level in women, sometimes in certain women, is too low and that can cause a variety of, of, uh, of, of symptoms just like high testosterone in a woman can be problematic. So that, that can cause problem from sexual dysfunction to, um, to actual fatigue and tiredness and low muscle mass and low bone mass and so on. And uh, to my knowledge, I think there are some ongoing investigation along those lines, but you guessed it, there is no agreement or consensus that you can really hang on to as far as what constitutes a normal value and when should you start, uh, that's still being worked out. I'm moving up. Anybody? Oh. <laughs> um, I was on Fosamax for about six years. Fosamax, six yes. years? Yes. And so I, I asked my doctor to take me off of it and she said, okay. And, um, she said, just keep your calcium up with your vitamin D uh, to 12,000 uh, milligrams a day. 1,200, I'm 1200, sorry. 1,200, the calcium. Day. Right, calcium. And that's easy enough to do. It really is. So is Fosomax really necessary? I mean, if somebody likes dairy, I can have three glasses of milk a day. That's 900. I could have a cup of yogurt. Wow. That's uh, 1,200 right there. And that's wow. not hard to do. Right. So, but, but, but the thing is you probably got to the point where you can manage it with calcium and vitamin D alone at this stage because you took Fosamax for the past five years. So if you would have asked a question six years ago, do I really need to take Fosamax? Can I just treat this with calcium and vitamin D alone? The answer is most likely no. I didn't know I had um, osteoporosis, right. obviously. But, but uh, yeah, but yeah. You, you took it for six years. And yeah. as I said towards the end, mm -hmm. uh, some research has shown that uh, 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 when women stop taking Fosamax and medication like Fosamax, it seems that the, the beneficial effect of that medication can stay with them for many years. So the protective effect of Fosamax on the bones can last for many years after you stop the Fosamax. If only they would push it for younger girls you know, to take 1,200 milligrams a day. Right, well, now, now that's, that's where you're right. I mean, so it is time yeah. to, to talk to the younger generation about dairy products, eating right, being active, eat, taking their vitamin D, taking their calcium to try to build their bones up so that when they reach that peak bone mass um, in their young adulthood, it will be a good, strong um, peak. <laughs> I just want to ask about the benefit of weight training exercises. That's what my doctor told me to do. Okay. Shame on me for not covering that, but there's just so much to cover. Oh, I know, but I... Um, th there are uh, different uh, types of exercise. Um, just as we said that being inactive, inactive lifestyle is a risk factor for osteoporosis. 
we know that activity is one of the treatments that are um, recommended for patients who have osteoporosis. And uh, we, we, there are two, there are actually three different types of, uh, of, of exercises. One is weight bearing and uh, kind of jogging or uh, high impact aerobics or I mean whatever your heart desires. Um, that, and the second one is strengthening exercise where you kind of, you actually lift weight to strengthen your muscles. And then uh, the, 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 the posture or the balance exercises, including modified yoga probably or things like that that will help you maintain a good balance. Because as we talked about, uh, when you have osteoporosis, sometimes it can affect your spine and you can get hunched like that and that can affect your balance and then that will put you at risk to fall and if you have osteoporosis and you fall, what's gonna happen? So yes, uh, exercise is very important, is extremely important and is part of the treatment plan. Um, getting back to the vitamin D, is it recommended for like, um, teenagers to be doing vitamin D in this area? Because I have a 14-year-old daughter and I've never really discussed it with the pediatrician if she should be doing the vitamin D supplement. Okay. Um, I think m most, actual, and, and there is a, a recent analysis by the government that puts, okay, l let me back up. It's very hard to get enough vitamin D from your diet. It's impossible. There are very few naturally fortified uh, 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 food items that are rich in vitamin D. Uh, egg, uh, uh, seafood, and mushrooms are the exception. So unless you really eat three pounds of mushrooms and a dozen <laughs> eggs and two pounds of shrimp every day, you're probably not gonna get enough vitamin D in your diet. So, so we end up getting vitamin D either from the sun which is non-existent here half the year, okay? And, or you're gonna need to take a supplement. Now, the, the, the government tells us that if as a young a teenager or a young adult, about 600 international units a day is probably gonna be sufficient. I, my personal experience, I did not conduct studies to show that. It's just personal experience throughout the years, I don't think that's enough. Um, I really think that at the minimum, especially here in Massachusetts, you need at least a thousand units of vitamin D a day, at least. And, and most of us need a lot more, probably. Um, of course, you will need less in the spring and summer when you are outdoor and you have more sun exposure. And you need more in the fall and winter when you are inside or it's too cold and you don't see the sun. Um, so I think it's reasonable to just kind of empirically start taking vitamin D, even for teenagers, even at a minimum, 400, 600, it's not gonna hurt. Um, if in doubt and you wanna be more specific and more sure, you can ask for that to get tested and, and it's very easy and very simple these days to measure the vitamin D level. You're welcome. I just have a quick question about calcium. Yes. Uh, is there one type better to take than another? And also, some of them have magnesium and zinc with them. Okay. What, what would be the best? Um, I don't have a preference. I'm an equal opportunity calcium <laughs> prescriber. Um, I, think, uh, I think the problem with calcium has to do mostly with side effects. A lot of patients cannot tolerate calcium and certain salts of calcium and certain brands of calcium because of GI side effects, constipation, cramps, and nausea, and what have you. So I don't have a preference. I tell my patients, you need 1,200 milligram a day, whatever which way you can get it inside your body. Try different formulation, try different salts, try different brands until you find one that works for you. Now, as far as additional magnesium and zinc, most of the time you really don't need any of those additional minerals in, in, in your supplement. Uh, those are minerals that are um, needed in smaller amounts and 
if you eat healthy, most likely you're going to get those from your uh, 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 balanced diet anyway, and you don't need any additional supplementation. Hi. I've taken Fosamax for quite a few years, and toward the end, I was having a lot of GI issues, so I stopped taking it. Yes. And so now I'm going to be put on Beneva. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering, same family, am I going to have the same issues? And I also take thyroid medication. How many hours in between? How am I going to manage that? Okay. So yeah, I guess you take, they're going to prescribe the Beneva by mouth, mm -hmm. which is the one you take once a month, right? right? Right. The, uh, the, no one can tell you if you're going to have the same kind of problems with Beneva as you did with Fosamax. It's, uh, it's variable. I have patients who have problems with all three of them. I have patients who do much better with this, much better with that, much better with that. The good news is that since it's a local effect from the actual medication at the site where you're ingesting it, the fact that Beneva is given once a month at least it appears that it's going to have a slightly lower risk of having given you the GI side effects because it's only once a month instead of daily or weekly like the Fosamax. So that probably is going to be what's going to happen, but until you try it and start taking it, you're not going to know. Now, as far as your questions about the thyroid medication, right. um, it's... It, it, I mean, you are in a bind here because taking the Beneva, you're going to have to wait an hour before you do anything, right. okay? And if you, if you take the uh, thyroid first, you're going to have to wait an hour too. So you're going to have to wait an hour either way. <laughs> so, so an hour before or an hour after. Right. If I get up in the middle of the night, took my thyroid medicine, I could take the right. Beneva in the morning. But I hate for you to get up in the middle of the night for that. I think I hate for me to go without breakfast. No? Yeah. <laughs> right, but, but you can wait and you can take your thyroid medication two hours after breakfast. The two thyroid medication, uh, the definition of an empty stomach for thyroid medication is one hour before eating or two hours after eating. What about the injection? Bypass the bypass is all that together. Uh, the, I have a comment here from the front. Uh, Beneva comes in an infusion that is given once every three months, quarterly, and that because it's an infusion, it bypasses the stomach and it has much less in terms of uh, GI side effects. But you're going to have to come into the hospital to get that infusion once every three months. It's an option. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just a couple of uh, questions is how often should the bone density test be taking, taken and also if one is on a drug holiday when is it time to how can you tell when it's time to revisit okay we, we uh, now, most experts now uh, say that once you start the medication for osteoporosis you probably need to have a bone density to evaluate your response to treatment at least every two years. I think, tell you honestly, I think most experts, most doctors would prefer it to be done once a year. Uh, I think there's a lot of pushback uh, about cost consideration that now they say the political statement is one to two years depending on the severity of your condition. So you're gonna need to have a follow-up of the bone density to see if you're really responding to the medication you're being prescribed. Now. The second question was, once you go on a drug holiday, mm -hmm. when, it, when is it time to revisit? It's the same thing. Let's say that you've been on Fosamax or whatever drug you, you, you were on, and you took it for five years, and then your doctor, after discussing it with you, told you to stop it, and you stopped it. You're probably still going to need to have a bone density in about two years after you stopped it to see if your bones have regressed in that meantime while you were taking no medication only vitamin D and calcium in the meantime so the same frequency the same interval probably still applies about two years um, 
Getting back to the medication dilemma with the Fosamax and the thyroid medication, yes. if we add Prilosec to that, which I'm supposed to take in the morning as well. Then you are enough. So uh, how would you manage that? Well, I mean, in, in, in that, the way that I look at it is that um, the thyroid medication can be taken any time of the day, as I explained. You can wait until after breakfast, before lunch, after lunch. So that's not going to be an issue. You can kind of just manip move it around that day. Mm -hmm. um, and given a choice between the Prilosec and the osteoporosis medication, the way that I look at it is osteoporosis medication is probably going to be take a precedence over that. And that's the one that you need to take, even if you have to skip the Prilosec that day. And uh, in addition, um, for chronic anemia, uh, taking iron, how does that impact the medication for osteoporosis, uh, in as well as iron infusions? So we have uh, weekly iron infusions and or supplemental iron. How would that impact um, the, the, uh, the medication? The absorption of the medication? Yes, or is there, you, you talked about some complications with some of the medications. Right. Um, I mean, the only thing that I can think of is if you take those iron supplement orally at the same time or very close to the osteoporosis medication. Uh, if you take in the iron supplementation in the IV, that should not be an issue. That should not be a problem. And uh, as I said, just make sure that on the day when you take that osteoporosis medication, your iron supplementation by mouth is given later. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> My hands are tied. She's the boss. I know. She's a good boss, too. She's tough. Um, doctor. Yes. Now, I don't want to put you on the spot, <laughs> but of all the Bothamax, Beneva, down the line, is there any, well, now my rheumatologist wants me to go on weak last. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to go on Fosamax. And I wouldn't take any of them because of the infusion because all these things you've been talking about, you don't know how it's going to be. So I am really, I'll be truthful, nervous to take any of it. Okay. I go to her Thursday. She wants to sit down and talk to me about weak last. Okay. That's one shot for the year. That's How right. How can something like that help your bones for a year? I mean, it, you know, the others were three months. One right. Month. You know what I'm saying? There's so many different stories that I can't. Right. Now, let myself. me, uh, uh, I mean, the, in defense of reclass, okay. you're not putting me on the spot. But reclass is actually not a new medication, Okay. Now, Reclass is a medication that we've been using for years and years under a different name. What? Zometa. We were using that for cancer patients. So it is a medication that we have a good idea of what it does and what it doesn't do, what side effects it does. We have a good 20 years or so track record for this medication. Okay? So then they discovered that patients who have cancer who take Zometa seem to improve with the bone. So he said, okay, let's repackage it. Let's call it something different. Let's change the dose. Let's give a smaller dose, a lower dose of this medication. Let's prescribe, let's study it for osteoporosis. And that's what happened. Okay? So in terms of your concerns about long-term side effects, they are valid. But I want to tell you that it's not like it's a brand new medication that just came on the market the other day. We've been using this medication, this chemical, for years and years. Now, Reclast, again, I'm not trying to put my personal preference here. Uh, outside of Forteo, the one that I told you is the strongest one, the one that you inject, that the rat cancer yeah. risk, okay? Put that on the side. Out of all the other, Reclass probably has the strongest data after it. It has very strong data in patients who have sustained um, um, a hip fracture. They, 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 they gave it to patients after they, after they uh, 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 sustained a hip fracture and had hip surgery, and it led 
to not only increase bone density and lower risk of future fractures, it also led to improved survival, meaning that they took a bunch of patients who had hip surgery, hip fracture, hip surgery, and they gave half of them reclast and half of them something else. And the group that received reclast, for whatever reason, seemed to live longer. Would that affect you if you had breast cancer? No. It has nothing to do mm -mm. with that. Mm -mm. How about prolia? Now that's the next one up. Prolia? prolia. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe well, I'll go and she'll suggest that. <laughs> well, it, it, it is an injection that, it, not in the IV, that you give every six months. Mm. It's brand new. So if you're concerned about possible side effects and some hidden side effects that we are not aware of, it's brand new. I just knew it was about taking but it's very strong and, and it helps lower the risk of fractures. Thank you. I've been on Zometa for almost four years. Hazel, I'm still standing, so uh, go with the reclass. What have you been on yet? The reclass. The Matthew? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. Now you do. Action. What do you do when you look good? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I solved a problem, doctor. Thank you. Yes. Hi. I want to apologize, but I want to go back to the weight um, thing. When you were talking about the weight, was that for normal people with the regular heights, the normal weights, and everything? Because I've been told that being overweight can put a burden on your bones. No, but that's different. That's a burden on the bones in terms of arthritis, the joints. It has nothing to do with the actual bone density and the bone strength okay. of that that will put you at risk for, uh, for osteoporosis. It is a well-known fact that patients who are <coughs> overweight, or big or muscular have stronger bones. That's irrefutable. Okay, but isn't osteoporosis arthritis? No, no. Oh, it's not. No, arthritis is inflammation of the joints. Oh, okay. Not the bones. Oh. Now, osteoporosis is when the bones themselves, as we explained, get weaker and then will put you at risk to develop fractures. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. I think he's been patiently waiting oh. there. You know, there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of talk and a lot of studies done about the effects of prescribing omeprazole and a lot of these drugs for, for GERD, you know, for reflux that, that dampen all the acid in the stomach and provides an environment for the malabsorption of calcium. Um, do, you, do you believe and have you seen that? Do you think it's a driver of the increased amount of, I mean, it seems like almost every other person is taking some form of an acid reducer a, P a PPI or some something, it, do you feel like that's driving a lot of the osteoporotic uh, patients that you're seeing? Or, I mean, it's it's very hard to tell. I think I think a, a lot of it is probably bias from uh, more awareness. I mean, the more we talk about a medical condition, the more are people curious. And then we end up checking them more for that condition. And now suddenly we have a sudden surge in prevalence. And uh, is it that there is a change in incidence? Or are we just discovering more that's always been there, but now because we are more, um, we check in more, we are discovering more. Um, but th there is a lot of talk, I agree with you, about the PPI, uh, uh, Prilosec, uh, Protonix, uh, Nexium and all of those medications that reduce acid in the stomach and how that can possibly be linked to osteoporosis. So the point is well taken. I mean, there's enough that they, they had to put it on the label. The label. Yeah. yeah, I know. So, yeah. I don't think it's limited by Okay. One side has been lost uh, due to osteoporosis, like Fosamax, for example, you say helps bone density. Is there any way to increase the height again or the curvature of the spine if you're starting to bend over? Um, not much. There's a process called kyphoplasty whereby they inject a little catheter into the collapsed vertebra. What happens when you 
what happens to patients who have osteoporosis is that their vertebrae, those bones in the spine, develop fractures and sometimes they can collapse and those are like brick-like bones that support your spine, a part of your spine. If they collapse, you're going to lose height. And if, if, if they collapse near the upper thoracic uh, and, and, and the neck area, they can cause the hunching of the back and so on. Now, there is a process called kyphoplasty whereby they go with a catheter into that collapsed vertebra and they inject some cement, some chemical that's going to fill that vertebra and build it back up, okay? Now, that helps reduce pain, that helps uh, strengthen that uh, vertebra, that part of the bone, uh, but a procedure like that is probably not going to help <coughs> advanced cases. It might help patients who are early on or developing maybe a, a collapse of just one vertebra that they can pump back up and bring into normal shape. But once you have developed several fractures and several collapse of those vertebrae and you're starting to develop the hunching of the back, it's unlikely that a procedure like that is going to help much. Um. I di didn't want to forget, before you leave, um, Dr. Kalani has brought materials on the table to take home with you. So I think we'll, we have one more question. Getting back to the uh, reclast, is it all right to have teeth extracted when you're on reclast? Because um, I had an oral surgeon that wouldn't um, ex uh, extract the teeth because I was on reclast. Right. Now, uh, how long have you been on reclass for? Three years. Three years. And when was the last time you, uh, you received the dose? This February, past okay. February. Um, I think most dentists that I talked to and most of what I read, uh, dentists will probably want to wait, want to kind of wait several months after you received your last reclass dose, and they may want something called the biomarkers, which are certain chemicals that um, we can detect in the urine and in the blood sometimes that will give us an idea of the balance between your resorption and your uh, formation of the bone. And when those markers are back in balance, that's an indication for the dentist or the oral surgeon that it might be safe to actually proceed with um, um, uh, whatever procedure that they were thinking about. What about if you have uh, abscess and you can't wait? <laughs> well, if you have abscess and you can't wait, then you can't it. wait. You had to have a root canal. Right. I mean, just like we come back to always a question of risk-benefit analysis. I mean, if you have an abscess like that, if you don't act on it, it might spread, it might get worse. So at that point, you might not have a choice. But if it was an elective procedure, then my answer stands.